Well, welcome everyone to this webinar. It's great to see so many people coming in and I know a few more people will drop in as we go, but I'm gonna get started. My name is Dave Powell. I'm the Senior Advocacy Manager here at Climate Outreach and a really warm welcome to this webinar, which in my humble opinion is launching one of the most important, interesting and exciting bits of work that we at Climate Outreach have done for many years. So uh, very excited to, to bring it to you. At Climate Outreach, we want everyone to feel that they are part of the climate story and right at the heart of that is trust you can have the best climate story in the world but if no one trusts you to talk about it then you might be wasting your time so this this webinar and this research that we're launching is all about trust how we can all be more trusted climate communicators how can we win trust and how can it be lost and a huge welcome to so many of you joining over 100 people already and a lot of people on this call are likely to be from climate campaigning organizations and we hope this is particularly relevant to you today we know from our wider britain talks climate research some of you may have been on the launch of that a couple of weeks ago we know from that research that lots of people aren't sure if they trust climate campaigning organizations and this this is a huge problem and we hope this research and today's webinar will help you work out what you might be able to do to improve that. Uh, so we hope you enjoyed today's session. I'll, I'll pass you over in a second to our speakers. Please do tweet about it uh, either now or afterwards. Use the hashtag Britain Talks Climate, which uh, will get it noticed and, and help to spread the word. Just a few bits of housekeeping. First of all, we are recording. We're already recording, but your voice won't be recorded because we're only doing questions and answers in the chat and your face won't be visible at any point. You, you'll notice that for now we've disabled the Q&A function, but we'll turn that on as we come towards the end of Louisa's presentation. So get thinking about your questions and then chuck it in the question and answer box. Do use the upvoting thumbs up thing in the questions and I'll pick the ones for our panel later that look the most uh, like people are most interested in asking them and we'll also have at the end we'll have uh, a little bit of information about what next we're going to be launching a workshop on the back of this and a little mentimeter survey to find out what you what you think you're going to take away from the survey uh, from the research a uh, huge thanks to a few people before i start to the european climate foundation for funding this work to our partners at climate barometer and our friends at more in common who worked with us on this research the organisations that joined us uh, at the turn of the year for an early roundtable looking at this work and all of the experts that we've spoken to, we've, we've uh, drawn on a lot of people's time and we are very, very grateful. So let's get started. Um, we're going to hear from three people. Uh, first of all, we're going to hear from Adam Corner. Adam used to lead the research team at Climate Outreach and he now co-directs Climate Barometer, which monitors and makes sense of what people think about climate change. After Adam, Adam, I'll ask you to pass straight over to Louisa Mello, who's our researcher here at Climate Outreach, who's led this work. Louisa will take you through the findings and the main presentation. And then there'll be a chance to ask questions to Adam and to Louisa and to Nikki Hawkins, who's a consultant who works with us here at Climate Outreach, specialising in climate communication and framing. Um, so just a reminder, we'll open the questions towards the end of Louisa's presentation. So, Adam, over to you to just say a few words to introduce us and then do pass straight to Louisa, please. Great. Thanks, Dave. And morning, everyone. Yeah, so just a few brief opening reflections from me, um, I think. So some of you may have come across Climate Barometer already. We launched it at the end of um, last year. And as Dave said, we're monitoring, making sense of what people think about climate change. And part of what we're doing and trialling, I guess, is working alongside ECF, European Climate Foundation, to try and help identify research gaps um, and questions that and insights needs um, for the sector. And this was actually the first bit of work that we um, identified as being a, a priority with, with ECF. And so we've just been working alongside Climate Outreach to, to craft some of the research questions and, and, and think through what to, what to make of the findings. And I guess, you know, the starting point here is an experience that um, is familiar to me. I feel like it probably will be familiar to a few of us on this call of looking at a list of trusted professions and people and thinking, okay, but I don't have David Attenborough to hand, so how do I use and put into practice guidance like this? And I think this research is a response to, to that experience, so kind of specifically not designed to generate a new list of trusted messengers, but to try and go a bit deeper, um, get under the skin of what trust actually means to people. Um, not just do you trust this person, but why do you trust in some contexts and not others? What does that mean to earn and build trust as campaigners? 
Um, you know, there's there, there's lots of different questions that I think go beyond that sort of ranking and ordering of, of, of people who have a given moment in time or for a particular reason or aim or goal um, trust. Um, yeah, there's, so there's loads to think about in the report, I think, and what Louise will present today. And, you know, definitely things that can quickly be kind of practically absorbed, hopefully, and, and taken on board. But I think it's also worth just saying, and maybe it's one of the reasons that we haven't moved much further around trust and trusted messengers beyond those kinds of lists is that it's quite tricky doing research on this stuff like you're unavoidably asking people to sort of reflect and project a bit how they would feel in situations and yeah maybe maybe that is why we don't have um up until this point as much of a nuanced understanding um as we do on audiences i think you know things like britain talks climate really kick things forward in terms of what we understand about audiences but this work is trying to bring a bit more nuance to understanding our, ourselves i guess rather than our audiences where where ourselves is is anyone doing climate engagement what do people what do people make of us so yeah i'll hand over to you louisa brilliant thank you adam all right so um, yes, hi everyone. Again, my name is Louisa and I'm a researcher here at Climate Outreach and led on this piece of work. So right up front, um, the key thing that we'd like you to take away from the session today is the recognition that trust is vital for effective climate communication and we can't outsource trust building, but we can understand how trust is won, how it's lost and to be better able to earn it. And in this session, we'll look at how we do that. So um, first of all, I'll give you a brief introduction of the research, then I'll take you through the insights on trust and influence, um, why these concepts matter, what makes a messenger trusted, um, and how to build trust and influence as a climate communicator. As they've said, then we have some time for Q&A and discussion, and then we'll close um, with some uh, outlook on, on what's next. Now, the report we've published uh, and this webinar today are sort of the culmination of a variety of methods um, that we use to examine trust and influence in climate communications. So we first started with a rapid desk review of some key resources on trust and influence, both from peer-reviewed articles and grey literature. Then we interviewed some experts from academia, think tanks and practitioners and how they think about trust and influence, and then held a roundtable to discuss the questions climate communicators have about building trust and influence in their work. Based on that, we then developed some um, sort of innovative focus group type workshops, which we ran online with each of the seven British segments. And I'll say more about those in a minute. Um, and we kept the topic of trust and influence intentionally broad in those workshops, um, at, to start with at least. And then we also moved on to sort of test different climate messengers through hypothetical scenarios and video elicitation. Um, and so, for example, one of the clips we showed uh, was by Cornish pensioner talking about the benefits of insulating her home and having a heat pump installed. Um, then we took those transcripts, coded and analyzed them and sort of corroborated what came out of them with the findings from the lit review and the interviews. And then finally, we spent quite a bit of time together um, to really make sense of this data and develop some insights and recommendations that climate communicators like you can use to operationalize and influence trust in their work. And you can find the results of that on the website and in the report that we published today. Now, um, many of you here will know about Britain Talks Climate already, but in case you don't, BTC is our free open access resource that provides an evidence-based, shared and strategic understanding of the British public and identifies ways to engage across the whole of society. BTC exists to help us to better understand and engage with people's priorities, questions, and concerns. And it helps us to tell a clearer, more compelling climate story that resonate with people of different values and backgrounds. Um, and our colleagues just published a brilliant 2024 update. So if you haven't seen that yet, definitely go check that out after this webinar. And in the BTC toolkit, um, there are seven different segments of the British population featured based on Warren Commons' core beliefs model. And these seven segments were developed based on people's deeply held values, beliefs, and worldviews rather than social demographic factors. And we use the seven segments in their support as well as a lens through which to understand different perspectives on trust and influence. So 
let's get to it then. What do we mean by trust and influence? Um, so trust is a person's belief that another person or institution will act positively and in the way they expect them to. So trust is the result um, of a combination of truster factors. So the person doing the trusting, trustee factors, the person to be trusted and the context. So trust factors might be things like a person's upbringing, their values, their life experiences, social economic determinants or political um, representation. And all of these impact a person's threat perception and propensity to trust in the first place. Now, trustee factors are largely about perception. Does this person seem like a trustworthy person? Do I have any information either from my own experience with that person or somebody else's account of their behavior or character that would make me inclined to trust this person in this situation? And that brings us directly to the third element, which is the contextual factors. Um, so the immediate situation surrounding the trust exchange. And you'll see that there is a difference between a stranger approaching you to ask for directions at a train station in the middle of the day and a stranger trying to do the same thing when you're walking through an unlit park at night. Now, it can be useful to distinguish between different types of trust. Um, so there's institutional, political and interpersonal trust. And whilst these are separate phenomena, they are interdependent. Institutional trust would be things like um, trust in the NHS, the Bank of England, or even things like marriage. Political trust is about trust in government and their values or motives. So the question, will government action lead to a good outcome for me or for society at large? And also confidence in government competence. So is the government actually able to implement the changes um, and will they materialize? Then interpersonal trust, which is more what we're focusing on in this report, um, there can be generalized interpersonal trust, which is about kind of whether people in general can be trusted, and then limited interpersonal trust, um, which for example would be that I trust my neighbor to accept a package for them, but I wouldn't trust them enough to lend them money, for example. And now there's obviously a place for healthy skepticism in a functioning society, but the conclusion we came to from doing this research is that if we want to have a positive influence on people, there needs to be at least some level of trust. And so trust matters for that reason, but also because it's fundamental to nearly all aspects of how our society functions. And more specifically, um, to transition to a low carbon society, people need to be able to trust the wide range of people and organizations that want to help us get there. However, Trust in government and the media is currently at a 10-year low, and the Ilma Trust Barometer found record levels of pessimism in the UK in 2023. And our partners at More in Common found that last year that um, people across the British society feel that the country is broken. And that is a problem because distrust in government is one of the key drivers of perceived polarization, which is not only an issue in and of itself, but polarization dampens people's belief that as a society, we can come together and effectively tackle complex issues, including climate change. Um, now, for any of us who've stepped foot outside our door and talked to anybody within the last year, um, none of this might come as a surprise, but as climate communicators, we have to be attuned to this political and social context, the mood, if you will, which affects the spaces in which our communications take place and how they will be received. So how then can we both build trust and be more trusted in this context? Looking at the evidence across the literature, our expert interviews and our focus groups with the public, we found that trusted people are generally seen as some combination of being human, sincere, down to earth, kind, reliable, and honest. And when we look at this list of characteristics, what really stands out is that these aren't fixed boxes that some people tick and others don't. And whilst this is a list of adjectives, it might be more useful to think of them as verbs, really. There are actions attached to them. Here's what one of the people in the disengaged Butler focus group said about this. It is kind of hard to say who I trust outside of family and friends. If I don't know you, I don't see reasons why I should trust you. I think it's just people who've proven that they care about you and to their actions that they're trustworthy. And influencers online, on TV, they haven't physically shown you anything. 
that means that earning trust at the scale we need for this transition goes beyond finding the right already trusted messenger or influencer out there. Instead, the question we need to ask is how we, as communicators, can get better at practicing these characteristics and demonstrate them effectively with the audiences we're trying to engage. And this is what this research is all about. So let's clarify a few things that we need to know as climate communicators about trust and influence. First of all, people need and in fact want to trust to live their lives. Across our focus groups, when we ask people about trust, the positive connotation it has for people came through really strongly. People described strong bonds with fam family and friends and used overall really positive and personal wording to describe what trust meant to them. And even those who found it hard to trust institutions or people outside their immediate circle acknowledge that trust is fundamental to many aspects of their lives. Here's what a person from the segment we call backbone conservatives said about trust. I think that you've got to have a certain amount of trust in nearly every situation working. Obviously, the job that I do, I'm working with children, so the parents have to trust me to leave their kids with me. Same as you trust a doctor to obviously look after you if you're sick, your bank. You've got to have trust in these people when you're giving them your money. Yeah, I think trust is a big thing for quite a lot of relationships. Second, trust helps people quickly work out who's on their side. In the literature, trust is often described as a heuristic shortcut, which is to say that it helps our brains to fast track decision making. If we hear from somebody we trust and respect, we're more likely to give it our attention because we know that this person has shown us that they're genuine and have our best interest at heart. And by extension, we think that whatever they have to say is likely to be relevant for us. In the words of one of our workshop participants, it's a gut feeling. Sometimes it's a gut feeling, and sometimes it's, you just go off someone's track record and that tells you what you need to know. However, on the flip side, that means that if a person or institution or group fails our initial heuristic test, they're going to have to work really, really hard to make us want to listen to them in the first place. So in a way, trust building can be seen as a process of inviting somebody to go beyond that snap decision about you and into a space where they can actually consider your message. Here's how someone who belongs to the Loyal National segment described this. Someone who's got something about them, or they've done something, or they've supported a cause, or if you're very into the environment, if they've done something for the social awareness, or if someone's built up something, you're going to give them a little bit more respect and have a little bit more time to learn about them, maybe. Third, trust is a sliding scale, not an on-off switch. When we talk about trusted messengers, it can be easy to assume that there are certain people who are just trusted by default and whatever they say will automatically be trusted too. Now, I think um, from doing this research and talking to people across the UK um, about trust has really brought home the fact that this assumption could not be further from the truth. Trust is constantly being negotiated and what we think about a person or organization at one point in time might be very different to how we see them now. Here's how one of our focus group participants described it. I mean, I've been in workplace situations where people have come across as incredibly genuine, and then six months, nine months down the line, you've seen that they've had ulterior motives, but also relationships, friendships, maybe friendships that you've had for years. And then it's all part of growth. But yeah, length of time, definitely. I'm more likely to trust somebody that I've known for years and has been dependable for years than somebody I met two weeks ago. So trust is not static, it's dynamic, and it's often built up over time, which in fact is great news for us because that means that there are things we can do to be more trusted and move up that sliding scale. And then finally, and this point is somewhat tangentially related to trust in infants, but no less crucial for understanding them, if a person or a message doesn't feel relevant, it doesn't stand a chance. Now, it might seem like an obvious point that we as communicators need to make our messages relevant to our audiences, but the extent to which this is true to the point where it's almost a prerequisite for having any kind of influence came through really strongly in our research. In one of the hypothetical scenarios we tested, um, we asked some participants if they could be convinced to attend a local town hall meeting about new walking and cycling paths in the area if they're invited to it through a poster at a bus stop. Um, and more than discussing sort of the impersonal invite from the poster or even their experiences with the local council itself, 
focus group participants' response to this hypothetical scenario across the groups was something like this. No, I mean, said council meeting, wouldn't really interest me. I don't cycle. I'm surrounded by cycle lanes where I live as it goes, and half the time cyclists don't use them. I don't cycle. I'm not a cyclist. It has nothing to do with who I am. Tune out, move on. And as much as the continent, continental European in me wants to throw up our arms and say that a bicycle is a mode of transport and not an identity, I have to listen, step back, and accept that this is a perfectly valid position to have. And then I lean back in and ask, that's so interesting, tell me more. So how do you get around? As communicators, we need to understand that this type of dismissal usually isn't due to ill will or disinterest even, but people simply have stuff going on. I don't really see the value in petitions, never hear anything come out of them. And then also, this isn't something I'm usually passionate about. So I'm busy working all day, then I've got the commitments and stuff. I doubt I'd spare 10 minutes to log onto the website and do all that stuff. And we need to acknowledge and work with that. Now onto some recommendations for how to navigate this. We've encapsulated these findings in the form of three qualities that communicators need to demonstrate to their audiences to trust them and to be open to influence. The first is passion. So the idea that this person really cares about this issue. They're clear why they're talking about it and passionate about connecting with their audience on this. The second is credibility. I believe this person knows what they're talking about and they're not just making it up on the spot. They don't have to be the leading expert on the topic, but I trust that they've taken the time to look into this issue, are taking it seriously, and they'll be honest about what they do and don't know about it. And then finally, empathy. The idea that this person is aware that people don't actually automatically know what they know and believe what they believe. They're not lecturing me or talking down to me. Now, I know this might sound really obvious, but when we stop to think, how often do we actually demonstrate these things in our day to day? The following quote is representative of many participants' responses from across the focus groups to the question of what they thought about the messengers and scenarios we tested. I feel like it's a sales rep. It just comes across as someone's trying to sell something, either wanting me to subscribe to something or do something that I would need to pay money for. Motive matters. When we talk publicly about climate action, people instinctively ask themselves, why are they saying this? What's driving them? Participants were really quick to dismiss any kind of messenger whose communications sounded like an advert. And so if we want to be more persuasive, we first have to ask ourselves what's motivating us to communicate. And the second question we need to interrogate is whether we actually genuinely want to understand our audience's perspective and where they're coming from. Now let's take me as an example here. Why am I talking to you all about trust and influence today? It's not enough for me to simply say that I think it's really important for every climate communicator to know this stuff. It's not even enough to say that even though I've really enjoyed thinking about these things in the past six months, I find it really hard uh, to shut up about them because I'm so genuinely interested in uh, the stuff we've been looking at. But this is about deeper motivation. I truly believe that if we practice this stuff, if we're curious about and have empathy for the people that we're talking to, we don't just build trust, but we're already making the just transition happen for them. Especially for the people to whom change has not been kind in the past and for whom net zero doesn't really sound like good news at the moment. And then how could I not share this with anyone who will listen to me? So don't get me wrong, these are hard questions. They require us to be vulnerable and to be honest with ourselves about the answers. And if we take them seriously, we have to be prepared that we might need to do things quite differently going forward. So then in summary, here are three things that communicators can do when it comes to building trust and influence in their climate comms. Find common ground and talk with, not at your audience. 
convey your passion and motivation as well as your credibility so that your audience doesn't have to jump to the wrong conclusions. And finally, make sure that your messenger fits your message and vice versa. Draw on familiarity and existing associations where you can. Now, everything I've just talked about um, up until now applies right across British society. Um, but as this is part of Britain Talks Climate, we also identified some differences between the seven British segments and how they relate to trust and influence. And here's an example of that for the segment that we call civic pragmatists. As some of you may know, um, what characterizes the segment is that they're a group that uh, really cares about others at home and abroad. They wish for less conflict and more compromise. They're less politically motivated, but more civically engaged, uh, including when it comes to climate change. Now in our focus group, civic pragmatists were the only segment to describe trust as a gut feeling. In line with what we know about the segment, civic pragmatists particularly value reliability and consistency of actions in trusted people. And relatedly for them, genuineness stems from being a stand-up person that stays in character. So somebody whose actions you can predict and depend on. As communicators, what this means is that we should approach sensitizing civic pragmatists about our issues by journeying them step by step. Trust building takes time and breaking down the door with a sort of radical ask right off the bat is very likely to put the segment off. So can we think of a more moderate entry point that doesn't negate our message, but meets civic pragmatists where they are? In our focus group, civic pragmatists' preference for local reference points also came through really strongly. So in our communications with them, we need to be clear about the local relevance of our issue and demonstrate that our appeal has the segments and their community's best interest at heart. Again, this is just a very brief teaser of, uh, for one of the seven segments, and I really encourage you to explore um, the segment and others in your report um, after this webinar today. Um, and this is the report. I think we're going to get a link to that in the, uh, in the chat very soon. And with that, I'll pass back to Dave. Louisa, thank you so much. It is fascinating stuff, and I can see the questions starting to come in. Um, just on that point, and uh, somebody who is it had asked, Elizabeth had asked a question, which has been answered. This is all now live on our site, and uh, my colleague Lawrence just put a link in the chat, so you can read plenty more about this. Please do have a read and a share, and tell your friends. It would be hugely, hugely appreciated. Um, so I'm going to ask, come to the panel maybe quickly for some first thoughts and I just wanted to ask maybe Nikki, first of all, what has really jumped out? What's the one thing that stuck with you from this bit of work? Maybe something you didn't know or has really crystallized in your head as a result of this research. Thanks, Dave. And thanks, Louisa, for that fantastic run through. Um, what really stuck with me um, and gave me a lot of hope um, from this research is the idea that we can sort of think about trust a bit like energy in that it doesn't disappear um it changes form and changes uh, where it's expressed and where it's felt so when there's talk of a kind of current low trust environment or trust being in short supply it's more that where people trust and who people trust has changed it's not that like people don't trust anyone or don't have any trust um in any of the people or institutions around them and i think that for me that is incredibly it gives me it gives me an incredible sense of kind of agency and hope um that we can work harder to understand how trust works and to earn it um rather than to sort of just you know hold our hands up and say well no one trusts anyone now thank you uh, adam your thoughts yeah i mean i was quite struck by you know in a sense what it tells us about where we are in the in in the transition and, and what people were coming to like so, some a lot of what people were saying was quite challenging you know giving us all these reasons as to why certain campaigns might not land as straightforwardly as we'd want them to um why our comms might not be working in different situations you know some 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 of it some of it just really is quite chewy and does 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 need thinking through but none of that was around like this is not an important issue this is not an important threat i'm questioning the seriousness or the relevance of this it was much more around you know the specifics the nuts and bolts and it's so it kind of just says like we're when we're asking this question now like you know who's trusted how can i build trust it's it's always in a particular context for a particular reason you know for a particular part of what, what the transition will now start to look like in a very tangible way and that's that's different i think to trying to sort of 
um, be be perhaps concerned or worried that we're not trusted on climate, which I think we 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 probably are. It's about what happens next. Thank you. And Louise, I mean, you've you've taken us through the research, but what really what stuck with you that you didn't know or you've really crystallized over this? Um, yeah, I think crystallize is, is probably the right word for it, because I think when we started with this, we kind of, you know, had some jam words about Ooh, what does trust mean? What do we like understand it to mean? And, and it was all sort of really broad thoughts. And then we opened it all up and really dug into, you know, this data all across these different sources and then came back to a conclusion that at first glance doesn't look so completely different from the initial sort of gut instincts that we'd had about trust. But six months of doing this has kind of shown me that, like, if we take this seriously, it changes everything. Um, and I think, you know, we can't, as climate communicators, expect more in terms of trust from people than we would expect from anyone else when it comes to trust, right? Um, and I think that that human element of it really came through for me. Amazing stuff. Um, so I'm going to turn to the questions that people are asking in, in question and answer. Please do add your question. And if there's something there that you really like the look of, give it an upvote because I'm leaning towards the ones that more people want answered. And the first question I'm, I'm going to come to Nikki, first of all, uh, is from Alice. And Alice says, do you have any examples of organizations or campaigns or I guess people that have successfully taken the approach you're describing that have successfully built trust? What you got? Um, thanks, Dave, and uh, thanks, Alice, for the question. Um, so I'm going to use a couple of examples of people um, and campaigns that I think do this well, two di very different examples. Um, one uh, has been talked about a lot, but I think sometimes we risk learning the wrong lesson from it, um, and that's Marcus Rashford's campaign about child poverty back in 2020. Um, and I think that the tendency there was to think, well, you know, we need more popular people who engage with uh, the kids um, who have lived experience um, to champion our issues. And whilst those things do matter, I think that the impact that Rashford had back in 2020 was much more about how he talked and how he connected with people in a really, really tough moment where people were feeling a lack of agency, a lack of um, kind of positivity about what you know what could happen and what good things could happen in our society and I think um, Marcus Rashford's campaign kind of gave people a sense of agency do you remember the the kind of um, the maps appearing of all the community centers and cafes that were donating um, free school meals for children in the holidays um, and he was really showcasing the idea that we can all do something we all want to do something he was speaking for people not telling anyone that they were wrong and I think that's really, really critical. And I think all too often and inadvertently when people talk, especially about climate, there is this instinctive sense, this person's going to tell me off. They're going to tell me something, um, you know, that's going to make me feel bad. And I think he flipped that and he actually, um, you know, I, th I think the same is true on social issues as well. He actually spoke up for people and spoke up for the positive role we can all have. So that's my, my non-climate example. My more climate relevant example is Prince William, who is pretty well trusted to talk about climate and nature, um, especially uh, given that he's not an expert, he's not Attenborough, but he has, you know, high levels of trust. Um, why? So, as you know, we talked about, we're not, we're not looking for celebrities that we can kind of, you know, put on our campaigns. We're trying to understand why that they are, um, you know, afforded the level of trust that, that, that they have. And I think, again, it's because he doesn't talk down to people. He makes a really human case. He talks about his feelings, his sense of responsibility his, to his kids, to younger generations. Um, he doesn't pretend to have all the facts um and i think possibly in contrast to other um equivalent figures maybe members of his own family um he doesn't signal that he is going to tell you off he signals that he is going to kind of speak up and do something quite purposeful um on on everyone's behalf um so those are my two examples thanks nikki um i will come i'll ask some other questions but feel free louisa and adam as i come back if you want to add anything to that um, Adam, there's a couple of questions here. There's one from anonymous attendee, but also a question from Kana, um, specifically looking at nonviolent direct action from environmental organisations. So, um, likes of Just Stop Oil, for example. And Anonymous's question is: How does nonviolent direct action from environmental organisations impact their trust and influence? What do you find from your broader work on this? 
I mean, I think it, I think it, it comes back and I saw there was, I was just kind of through the questions and there's, you know, something similar around um, uh, that sort of tension that we all feel between wanting, needing to push ahead as fast as we possibly can um, versus taking the time to sort of do the, what this kind of work would involve. And is that a difference between like moderate or, or, or kind of um, more ambitious um, approaches and I, I wonder whether it actually it isn't a distinction between you know being moderate and being more ambitious um, but it is about um, trying to be really careful about where the levels of agreement that we already have among the public are and not not kind of getting that wrong as a starting point so it is I mean it's maybe a little bit of a, of a glib way to, to to set it up but if you look at the polling on support for insulation, essentially insul insulating Britain, like it can't be any higher really, like there is maximum agreement with that, with that end goal. Um, so I think obviously there's a sense in which some people, yeah, like don't want to be disrupted in, on a car journey. Um, my feeling is that it's not really just about that, the broader sort of, I'm not sure about this, low trust ratings that you would see on the more typical kind of you know, putting, putting groups in, in different um, order of, of, of trustworthiness is some is somehow to do with 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 that feeling that uh, we already agree with you and what we want to know is how to get there like we want to we want to work kind of work together on on what the getting the conditions of that right you know making the the, the, the t's and c's in place that mean that they are fair to people um and it's not it is no longer just the kind of let's persuade you that this is where we need to get to it's just really about how and the trust building is in that space i think Excellent. Louisa, either from this work or from our wider Britain Talks climate work, what, what do we know about nonviolent direct action and uh, whether that impacts trust and influence? Um, I think you might be better to speak about the more general BTC update on this. Um, but I think, as, as Adam has said, sort of the issue is not around the issue itself. Um, it's about the, the impact um, sort of people feel it, it has in their lives or or in them personally if they're being um, sort of stopped in the street um, they feel like they're being personally attacked sometimes in a way and I think I think that's kind of the the issue that we're trying to sort of come to with this work is that trust building is about showing people that you are on their side and that can look like you're sitting you know in the street or that can look like you're talking to them right like I think it's it's very much about the the how and it's not an either or um, and also again I think I just want to say on this question between you know time is running out and we need to take time to build trust I think that's definitely a tension that we feel also and that we felt in writing this this piece of work um, but I think it's a tension that can't be necessarily resolved but that we can definitely harness and I think that if we want to bring about a transition that is lasting and that's actually like you know substantially better than what we have at the moment then we're going to have to do it right like it's it's not so it's a non-negotiable in a way and that doesn't mean we can't also go fast like um i think you know if you show people that you're doing this for a chance at a better society then you might be surprised at how quickly they say yeah go let's 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 do it nikki i'm going to bring you in a you can either talk to that, but also this question from Stephanie that, that both Louisa and Adam have talked to. So the the tension between that, there isn't enough time, I'm really worried that we're running out of time, but also a lot of what we're hearing from Louisa is that trust building takes time and can be easily lost. So how do you navigate that balance between the urgency of the situation and needing to take time to build trust with people? So I would say I don't think we have time not to do this. I think that actually trying to sort of spark the level of change that we know we need to see uh, without people feeling that the people trying to do that and the people trying to make that happen are on their side is a recipe for sort of backlash and uh, delay. Um, and I think that, you know, to, to, to connect that with the question of sort of nonviolent direct action, um, I think there's a mismatch in terms of how um, people who are engaged in those kinds of campaigns and who are so dedicated and so passionate um, to, you know, preserving the future of humanity, um, what their own personal motivation is and how people perceive their motivation. Um, and I think that 
that's something that we need to address. We need to address this issue of, um, am I getting across um, what I'm really doing this for, what this is really about, what I'm trying to make happen, or am I somehow kind of creating the impression um, that I'm telling people off, I'm, I'm lecturing them, I'm, I'm inconveniencing them, I'm getting in their way, um, and failing to get across this idea that actually this is this is in itself an act of empathy. Um, and I think that I don't think we have time to keep missing the mark um, in terms of the extent to which people think we are on their side. Thanks, everyone. I'm going to ask a question here, which is the question from John. Um, and waggle your hands on me. I can see you. Waggle your hands on me who'd like to answer on this. And the, the question is about conversation. So John says, it sounds as though the key is conversation, a conversational approach, rather than posters and adverts. Does that sound right? Um, Adam's waving at me off. Again. Waggling his hand. Um, yeah, I, I think I think it's a really a really good question, and it 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 was it because I think the next the, almost the next layer of what to think about here then is to say, okay, you can you can do this work and sort of shake the tin and find out what what can we what can we know a bit more in a bit more depth about trust credibility, um, and every different organization and group can then look at that work and say, like, to what extent to, to, does what I'm doing at the moment fit with this or not? And, like, you know, how might, how might we kind of adjust it? But um, I don't think it points to there being only one way to do this, right? And it's don't think anything about this says, like, no more need for those big headline campaigns or, or indeed kind of posters and billboards that that really do, I think, help to to set that surround sound in lots of ways. So there's a question about what they say, you know, and are they having an argument with an audience that already agrees or are they trying to reinforce where it's true, the positive support that is there that needs to be built on. Um, but this thing about, you know, being on, being, being on and being perceived to be on people's side because we are not because we're giving that impression I just it feels like it's just the, the center of, of everything at the moment as we move to the next sort of phase of the transition and I think I think conversations and listening and you know those kinds of dialogue based interactions it, you know this stuff's been talked about for a long time and and, and and done for a long time in some contexts as well that there's really great kind of community engagement methods that are out there that have been used but sparingly and in a bit of an ad hoc way I think you know um but around like um, local authorities and climate plans um, lots of people in this court will be familiar with them I'm sure um but I think really that that that, that the process of trust building now can't there is no way around that that kind of close quarters community engagement um looking at what happens next because everything involves people you know tacitly or actively um being up for some of this and feeling okay with it it's not it's less about persuading in principle I don't think there's there's a very tiny group of people that are ideologically opposed to heat pumps but there's a much bigger group of people who who don't yet think that the offer on the table is fair for them um and that question of not being caught on the wrong side of the fence and holding the terms of an unfair transition um feels kind of very central to all of these questions around where trust will go from here for us us in the broadest sense of kind of campaigns folk thank you adam um so we've got about five minutes left for questions i'm going to um chuck together a couple of themes that, I, that are coming through into one grouped question about uh, social media social media and types of having communication so people have asked from various aspects we've got questions in here about what does all of this imply for using social media what's the best way to use social media um, in particular young people say that they get so much of their information about the world from social media so what does that imply um who on the panel waggle your hand at me nikki is waggling a hand nikki yeah what are your thoughts on social media and trust building yeah, just to connect that question with the previous one, um, I think that what's contained in this research and the work that we've done to interpret it is as applicable to a conversation one-to-one -one as it is to a kind of high-profile kind of massive campaign um, in multi-formats, multi-channels, um, or a kind of campaign or, or just a piece of content on social media. And I think one of the keys to unlocking what we have here is really thinking about tone, really thinking about how what you're saying and the way that you're saying it is going to come across to people, 
Is it signaling this sense of being on their side, um, understanding where they're at with this? Or is it signaling a approach that I think we need to leave behind of, um, you know, trying to tell people, we're going to tell you, this is how it is. I'm going to assert this truth because you need to hear it. You need to act on it now. And so I, my, my one key word is tone. Can we think about how we use and, and apply um, and benefit from um, taking an entirely different tone um, across, across content? Just, yeah, like briefly to add on to that as well, if that's okay, Dave. Um, and I think, yeah, a very much adjacent to tone is, is like social media as a vehicle for surfacing the, the right stories basically you know which can be crafted in an incredibly like careful and well-tuned way and then 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 you know whatever platform it is you're using is just a kind of portal into that content you know it doesn't I think it's it's good to not slip into that sense of like social media equals sort of somehow like superficial sort of persuasive um promo content um versus real life conversations are where where the authenticity is like it can be there all the way through I think like like Nikki says um but I guess the bit that we haven't collectively done enough of yet is is the more person to person conversational stuff. It's still there, I think, as a big as a big need alongside the rest of the comms engagement channels that we we have more to hand, I guess. Great stuff. Um, in the question and answer at the bottom, Claire from Larger Us has put some work to the brilliant work Larger Us is doing about climate conversations. I strongly strongly recommend that. So, just the last question for you, and maybe you might also want to take your opportunity to uh, say a few final remarks. This question from Ben is about polarization. And Louisa, you did sort of talk to this in your in your slides, but Ben's question is how much does polarization block or affect trust? So if you sound like a Remainer um, or a Londoner or an atheist or an immigrant or whatever, does that prevent you being able to have effective communication with people who see that, I guess, as uh, a threatening identity to them? Yeah, happy to, to talk about that. I think our identities are not something we can really do very much about. And I think if we try to make it look like we are something we're not, that's already not going to work, right? Like people, like in our focus groups, we're on such hyper alert for anything that seemed disingenuine or like an advert or someone was being told to say something that they don't actually believe. And I think the way to go about this is to just say, um, look, I am a white woman from Germany working in the UK, but what I found is that what I've seen in my life is that, you know, you, you need to bring it back to your experience and use it to your advantage to say, like, I'm not hiding this, this bit about me, but actually it's enabling me to have this very unique experience of whatever issue I'm looking at. And then people can say, okay, well, I disagree or I agree with this, but at that point it feels like they're speaking from the heart that they're not speaking for it that polarized block over there, but they're actually saying like, this is this is what I believe and what I stand for. And if after you've sort of asserted that identity, if you, if you then say, and I, I believe that, you know, climate action needs to, needs to be fair for everyone. And there are people who've been left behind. I think you'd, you'd have a hard time finding anyone who really disagrees with that. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah, I think in terms of polarization, there needs to be much more deliberate um, strategic effort to find the common ground that cuts across kind of more polarized perspectives on this. I think that there is a lot that we share when it comes to how we're thinking and feeling about climate change as a society, as a nation. And all too often, the communications and the stories actually tap into the, the bits that are less shared. So looking at things like actually the desire to as Adam says, sort of move on to the next stage of action. So we stop just banging the drum, sounding the alarm, and actually start talking much more about the positive uh, action that's underway and the change and the progress that's possible. Um, that is something that is, I would say, almost universally um, kind of appealing. And I think also thinking about people's values systems and the the shared values and the shared ideas connection with nature sort of responsibility to young people and future generations uh, we need to be speaking to those activating those much more than we speak to things that might feel more contested or more divided or polarized 
Adam, any final remarks? Yeah, I mean, and I guess it's like it's similarly to larger us, like there there are some some really great examples of of groups doing that kind of story work and local storytelling exchange. It's one of I've been involved with personally, but there's but there's there's certainly others as well. Um, and I think I think maybe just in to go back to that, yeah, the the, the polarization question and what Louise's response was to it. I think just it's 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 really well put like the more that we can feel like it's okay to sort of put our cards on the table about who we are where we're coming from like this 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 question that was in the deck that Louisa shared of um what what motivates you in this conversation and and I, it's kind of disarmingly simple and then you think about it and you think actually do we actually say much about this or do we just assume that that's kind of taken um for granted or that we everyone knows where, where we're coming from or could we to some people be inadvertently being positioned is precisely as salespeople for this thing that we actually don't feel like we represent that's not where we're coming from um so yeah i think for me it was kind of looking through when, when, when we when we when we when we when we had these kind of like focus groups to look at afterwards it was it was kind of thinking would would i would i be persuaded in this situation as well that's maybe a, a good question to ask too Thanks, everyone. It's great stuff. Um, and Elizabeth, you'd ask a question about um, tips to avoid people feeling defensive. We've done some of that, I think, in this conversation. Also have a look at Climate Outreach's Talking Climate Handbook from a few years ago. If you Google Talking Climate and Climate Outreach, you'll find a lot of stuff that hopefully will help you have better climate conversations. Great stuff. Um, Lauren, if you're there, we'd, we'd love to just get your thoughts before you head off the call, everyone. Um, and to do a quick Mentimeter poll, it'll take you uh, 30 seconds. Lauren's going to put up a link on the screen. We'd love to know what one thing you will try out as a result of this webinar. It's great for us to know and to capture a bit of a spirit of energy in the room. So uh, if you put in the code, which is at the top of the screen there at menti.com, or if you are that, that'd be fantastic. Um, do please do this. It's great for us to learn what's landed with you and to help us think about uh, what we could do next as a result. Give people 30 seconds just to do that. And while those are going in, we just want to say a bit about what we at Climate Outreach are going to do next with this work. As I said at the beginning, this feels to us like very important stuff the starting point really we've cracked into one of the most important things about climate conversation um, and what we think the best way to embed those what we're learning from here and continue to learn ourselves is through practical application so many of the questions in the q a were about yes fine but how do i kind of do this so we've all got the potential to be great climate communicators but actually a lot of that is about finding out what this means for us and the work that we do so we are piloting a workshop we're going to be working with our partners and friends at parents for future over the next couple of months to build and test a workshop that basically organizations like hopefully most people on this call would be able to use and which would help you to think about what this means for your work and plot what to do with it and continue to learn. So we are gonna send out, once we've, once we've devised that workshop with Parents for Future, we're gonna roll it out and make it available much more widely. Uh, Lauren's gonna send a follow-up email with all the links to the deck and also with a feedback form. And at the bottom of that feedback form will be a little expression of interest if you'd like to learn more about that workshop when it's done. Also, please, please, please do do the feedback form. Uh, people generally don't on these kind of things, but it's so exceptionally useful for us to know what's worked for you, what hasn't worked for you, how we can do better, what you're gonna do next, all of these things. Uh, it's the best way to learn and make sure we continue to give you great stuff. Um, fantastic, thank you so much for all of your engagement. To the panel, thank you so much. Louisa in particular for taking us through the work, Nikki and Adam for your very wise brainy thoughts. Uh, you can contact us at the, at the address on the screen there. Uh, do drop us a tweet at Britain Talks Climate. Do please share this work. Tell your friends, tell your family. And it's all online and the link will come around from Lauren afterwards. Thank you again to the European Climate Foundation for funding this and to Lauren for behind the scenes amazing tech work. And I think we're done. Thank you so much, everyone. And we'll see you very soon for another Climate Outreach webinar. Thank you.